First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Listen carefully to the conversation and answer questions 1 to 5. Hi Andrea, how are you feeling now that exams are over? It's fantastic to have finished, isn't it? And to sleep in every morning. What about you? Well, I've been catching up on sleep too, but I've got a lot to do before I leave for England. Perhaps you could give me some advice. I've got a lot of things I can't possibly take back with me, but I don't know what to do with them. Well, it depends on what sort of things they are and whether you're thinking of giving them away or selling them. Well, almost everything. Furniture, the fridge and other kitchen stuff that I bought from the previous tenant. But the new people have already got what they need, so they're not interested in buying stuff from me. I can't afford to give it away, but I'm not sure how to sell it all. Oh, and there are some clothes and books as well. Why can't you take them? The books are really heavy. It's so expensive if you exceed the airline baggage allowance. And the clothes just won't all fit in my suitcase. It's amazing how much stuff I've accumulated since I've been here. Anyway. I don't think I'll need as many summer clothes in England as I have here in Australia. I see. Well, there are several alternatives. First of all, you could put up notices around the university about the books. You know, on the notice boards in the Student Union Building and in the Economics Department. Anywhere second and third year students will see them. People are always keen to buy cheap textbooks. OK. Wh what should I say on the notices? Just put the titles, authors and price you want, your name of course, and maybe put your phone number on those little tear-off tags. That's a good idea. And what about the furniture? You could try doing the same thing, but usually students are away all summer, so they don't want to buy furniture now. Another place to try might be a second-hand shop. Someone from the shop will usually come around and give you a free quote, and then you can decide. But you don't usually get much money for that sort of stuff. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Another alternative is to put an advertisement in the Trading Post. Do you know that paper? It comes out every week advertising things people want to sell. You have to pay to put the advert in and then hope people phone. Give them as much information as possible and if they're interested, invite them to come and have a look. The hard part is agreeing on a price. No, I haven't seen the Trading Post. But I should have a look at it, and I could advertise the fridge, the microwave, and the furniture. But the kitchen stuff isn't really that good. You know, old cutlery, a few pots and pans, and some plates and things. What shall I do with them? Well, another option is to donate the kitchen things to a charity shop. You know, like the Salvation Army or St Vincent de Paul. Why don't you get a second-hand shop to give you a quote first? Yes, I could do that. Find out how much they'll give me and then decide whether to sell them or give them away. But I've still got the clothes. A charity shop will take them too, as long as they're in good condition. And even though you don't get any money, at least you know that someone who really deserves some help has benefited. That's a good point. I'll advertise the expensive stuff the furniture, and donate the clothes and kitchen stuff. Let's go and buy a trading post and you can help me write the advert. Well, 
actually, I'm interested in buying the fridge and the microwave, depending on the price, of course. OK, let's see how good you are at bargaining. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear two students and their tutor discussing a survey project. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 16. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 16. So, what's the survey about, Tom? It's about where students want to live and how they choose. Basically, their accommodation preferences. We've actually tried it out with a few students already. OK, that sounds fine. So, to start with, how many questions have you got? Hmm, 20? Is that too many? Yes, it is, really. People get fed up answering lots of questions and they stop thinking about their answers. Right, so we need to think about that again. What do you think of the first three questions? Um, uh, you want to know what affects students' choice of accommodation when they go to university? Yes, we want to find out which has the most effect, the cost, the number of rooms in the house or flat, or the distance from campus. And then we asked another question. Oh, yes. What else did you want to find out? Well, we wondered whether public transport was important. You know, not many students have cars, so it might be quite important for them to be near somewhere where they could catch a bus or train. Yeah, that's a good question. Before you ask any more people, I've got a couple of suggestions for improving the questionnaire. First of all, I think you need to ask fewer questions. As I said, 20 is really too many. I'd cut it down to 10 if I were you. OK, 10 questions only. And is there anything else you think we should do? Well, yes. Some of the questions are actually quite complicated. I think you should make them clearer. I mean, I think they should be easier to understand. And what do you think about asking more questions about cost? No. I don't think you need any more about cost, but you could ask a couple more questions about the reasons for students' decisions. So we should ask some more questions with why? Yes, I think you'd get quite a lot more information if you did that. Thank you. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 17 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 17 to 20. Um, we've already got some results from our first questionnaire. Do you think we could use them? I don't see why not. What have you found out so far? Well, the number of rooms was only important for 16% of the people we asked. It looks like a lot of students are quite happy to share a room, and even fewer people were concerned about being near a bus stop. Uh, only 10%, in fact. I'm surprised about that. But what about the distance from the university? Well, that was quite important. 
Around 20% of the students we asked wanted to be close to campus. Hmm, that makes sense. And what about the cost? <laughs> yeah, as we expected, the cost was by far the most important factor. More than half the students were concerned with the cost, 54% to be exact. Only 54%? I thought it would be closer to 80%. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. Good evening and welcome to this month's Observatory Club Lecture. I'm Donald Mackey and I'm here to talk to you about the solar eclipse in history. A thousand years ago, a total eclipse of the sun was a terrifying religious experience. But these days, an eclipse is more likely to be viewed as a tourist attraction than as a scientific or spiritual event. People will travel literally miles to be in the right place at the right time to get the best view of their eclipse. Well, what exactly causes a solar eclipse? When the world goes dark for a few minutes in the middle of the day. Scientifically speaking, the dark spot itself is easy to explain. It is the shadow of the moon streaking across the earth. This happens every year or two, each time along a different and to all intents and purposes a seemingly random piece of the globe. In the past, people often interpreted an eclipse as a danger signal heralding disaster, and in fact the Chinese were so disturbed by these events that they included among their gods one whose job was to prevent eclipses. But whether or not you are superstitious, or take a purely scientific view, our earthly eclipses are special in three ways. Firstly, there can be no doubt that they are very beautiful. It's as if a deep blue curtain had fallen over the daytime sky as the sun becomes a black void surrounded by the glow of its outer atmosphere. But beyond this, total eclipses possess a second, more compelling beauty in the eyes of us scientists, for they offer a unique opportunity for research. Only during an eclipse can we study the corona and other dim things that are normally lost in the sun's glare. And thirdly, they are rare. Even though an eclipse of the sun occurs somewhere on earth every year or two, if you sit in your garden and wait, it will take 375 years on average for one to come to you. If the moon were any larger, eclipses would become a monthly bore. If it were smaller, they simply would not be possible. The ancient Babylonian priests, who spent a fair bit of time staring at the sky, had already noted that there was an 18-year pattern in their recurrence but they didn't have the mathematics to predict an eclipse accurately. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30.
Now listen and answer questions 27 to 30. It was Edmund Haley, the English astronomer, who knew his maths well enough to predict the return of the comet, which incidentally bears his name, and in 1715 he became the first person to make an accurate eclipse prediction. This brought eclipses firmly into the scientific domain, and they have since allowed a number of important scientific discoveries to be made. For instance, in the eclipse of 1868, two scientists, Janssen and Lockyer, were observing the sun's atmosphere, and it was these observations that ultimately led to the discovery of a new element. They named the element helium after the Greek god of the sun. This was a major find, because helium turned out to be the most common element in the universe after hydrogen. Another great triumph involved mercury. I'll just put that up on the board for you now. See, there's Mercury, the planet closest to the Sun, then there's Venus, Earth, etc. For centuries, scientists had been unable to understand why Mercury appeared to rotate faster than it should. Some astronomers suggested that there might be an undiscovered planet causing this unusual orbit, and even gave it the name Vulcan. During the eclipse of 1878, an American astronomer, James Watson, thought he had spotted this so-called lost planet. But alas for him, he was later obliged to admit that he had been wrong about Vulcan and withdrew his claim. Then Albert Einstein came on the scene. Einstein suggested that rather than being wrong about the number of planets, Astronomers were actually wrong about gravity. Einstein's theory of relativity, for which he is so famous, disagreed with Newton's law of gravity in just the right way to explain Mercury's odd orbit. He also realized that a definitive test would be possible during the total eclipse of 1919, and this is indeed when his theory was finally proved correct. So there you have several examples of how eclipses have helped to increase our understanding of the universe. And now let's move on the social. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear an introduction about an eco-friendly building called the Gherkin. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Today, I'd like to tell you about how UK architects are playing their part to address the issue of global warming. You have seen many of these iconic buildings while going about your everyday life, but you may not know how they are affecting your tomorrow. In 2003, Construction was completed on the famous Swiss rebuilding, or more informally called the Gherkin, a true masterpiece commissioned by the law offices of Foster and Partners. 
This is not the first ambitious endeavour of the firm. They are renowned for their various philanthropic environmental efforts. The Gherkin, with its cut-and-edge green initiative and sharp design, is gaining recognition as an icon in modern architecture. You can pick it out of the London skyline by its unorthodox cigar shape. While its appearance is the obvious attribute at which to marvel, there is far more to this building than meets the eye. And let's face it, there's a lot about this building that meets the eye. The building helps reduce the city's carbon footprint in a number of ways. Just a quick note, in case you're not familiar with the term carbon footprint, get used to it. It's a buzzword you'll hear relentlessly to talk about reducing emissions. Think of it as the amount of harmful greenhouse gases that are given off into the environment by a single person, organization or product. So going back to the Gherking building, perhaps the most obvious as well as the most significant eco-friendly feature is the glass windows, which allow light to pass through the building, both reducing heating costs and brightening up the workspace. The ingenuity behind the various eco-friendly aspects of the Gherkin has seen its fair share of publicity both from serious and silly sources. In a recent April Fool's Day edition, one e-publication printed a story detailing plans to replace 50% of the current exterior with grass, which would not only make large steps in the name of sustainability, but also give the building the green hue that would truly earn it the nickname of the Gherkin. The only drawback is, as you may have guessed, that this story was an April Fool's Day joke and completely made up. In all seriousness though, the building is setting a new standard of design that other architects and city planners just cannot ignore. The building's bold and cost-efficient design has won a number of architecture awards, including the Sterling Prize, the London Region Award, and the Empress Skyscraper Award, among others. The design comfortably accommodates a large number of offices, while keeping maintenance and operation costs down, striking a superb balance between nature and the workplace. Nature is well and good, as long as the weather is nice outside. Given London's notoriously bad weather, the architects knew they must devise a quality temperature regulation system, and that they did. A special system designed to reduce the building's reliance on air conditioning was devised that cuts consumption in half compared to standard office buildings. There are atria that link each floor vertically to one another, forming spiralling spaces of the entire building. They serve not just as social common spaces, but also act as the building's lungs, distributing clean air from the opening panels in the facade through the entire building. The building isn't all business though. It has its fair share of fun as well. At the very top, a club room offers a picturesque entertainment spot for company functions, private parties, etc., with a breathtaking panoramic view of the city. The creation of such an innovative structure has many wondering what the future of urban planning and architecture may be. Well, if the other projects currently commissioned by Foster and Partners are any indication, the entire city constructed with similarly eco-friendly buildings is not far in the distance. The Mazda City development aims to create a desert city that produces zero waste and removes as much carbon dioxide from the atmosphere as it puts in, a huge feat in protecting our Earth. The Gherkin is a truly impressive feat, yet it is not the only one worth noting. Now to move on to another green initiative, I'll tell you about the Eden Foundation building found in Cornwall. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.